in the first three lectures, uh, in overview, I've tried to get three ideas across. So the first one is that um, frustration can lead you to macroscopic classical ground state degeneracy. And um, the second and third ones have been that, um, on the one hand, when we look at excitations out of the ground state, we can get a classical version of fractionalization. So we saw in the triangular lattice that flipping a single spin produces two vortices in the height field that we can separate at no cost in energy. And we saw in the case of spin ice that, again, flipping a single spin produces two excitations, in that case, monopoles, which uh, we can separate uh, at no cost in energy in a nearest neighbor model. Um, and the third idea that I hope became clear uh, was that um, we have long distance ways of thinking about the uh, ground states in both the triangular lattice and the uh, pyrochlor Ising antiferromagnet in terms of these, uh, well, in the uh, spin ice case, uh, what was clearly an emergent gauge field, this divergence free field. Uh, and uh, you could use similar language in the two-dimensional case or otherwise talk about uh, a height model. So the main thing that I'd like to do in this lecture is talk about ways in which we can connect those ideas uh, that we developed in the classical system uh, with uh, quantum problems. So I want to talk about a link between uh, those classical ideas and spin liquids. And uh, the most efficient way of making that link, I think, is uh, via what are called quantum dimer models. So I'll start out with some general introduction and then uh, I'll suggest to you reasons why it's natural to think about what are called dimer models and I'll explain some classical background which will connect uh, dimer models with the ideas I've talked about so far. And then in the final part of the lecture, I'll talk about quantum dimer models and uh, summarize for you some of the things that we've learned about them from doing uh, simulations. OK, so um, thinking about quantum spin liquids, um, a reasonable place to start is uh, to ask ourselves how we should define what we mean uh, by a, a quantum spin liquid. And um, the first thing that you might say is that uh, you want uh, a quantum ground state with the sorts of properties that I was talking about in the case of the classical systems. So uh, that's to say we want a quantum ground state which um, doesn't have an AL order or uh, come to that any other kind of order that we can detect with uh, a local order parameter. So the first requirement is uh, to have a ground state with um, the symmetries of the Hamiltonian unbroken um, and certainly we would like that but uh, you can point to examples which um, suggest that we should ask something more than that um, so to be concrete consider a square lattice bilayer with nearest neighbor interactions. So what I mean is we take one example of the square lattice, and then uh, we have, as a second layer, another copy. 
and we have interactions, say, J between nearest neighbor sites in each layer, and some interactions between the sites that are vertically above each other in different layers, which we call J prime. So if J prime is small compared to J, then we expect the behavior to be pretty much the same as in a single bilayer, uh, in a single layer, and um, because the square lattice is unfrustrated, uh, in the ground state we get uh, nail order. So certainly that's not a spin liquid. But if we go to the other limit where J primed is much bigger than J, then um, to a first approximation, we can understand the behavior of the system by considering uh, just a pair of sites coupled by this strong interaction. And um, the ground state will put this pair of sites into a singlet. And if the interactions J between uh, different pairs are weak, then uh, they won't have much effect. And so you just get uh, a set of singlets. So these singlets don't break any symmetry, so they'd be uh, a state that um, satisfies this first condition. But at the same time, we hardly want to call it a spin, spin liquid because, uh, for example, if you got this model from a Hubbard model, you could imagine changing parameters continuously so that uh, you went uh, between this state and uh, an insulating state with a, uh, one band filled and the other band empty. Um, and uh, so it's a very ordinary state of matter. So it's often useful to have some extra conditions which you'd uh, require as well. And uh, a second condition which you could require is that uh, you have uh, half integer, or more generally, half odd integer spin uh, per unit cell, uh, which would exclude this bilayer example, because if we have spin a half on each layer, then altogether we've got integer spin per unit cell. And there's a general or reasonably general result, which tells you that something more interesting should happen if you do have half odd integer spin, um, which is known as the um, lieb schultz mattis theorem. So it says that if you have uh, half odd integer spin and at least uh, U1 rotational symmetry, then um, the gap between the ground state and the first excited state uh, goes to zero as the system size goes to infinity at least as fast as one over the linear system size. So in other words, you have uh, some low energy uh, states in this case. And there are various ways in which that can happen. Um, so one way in which it can happen is just that you have some uh, broken symmetry. Uh, so the ground state and the first excited state would be a pair of states that are related by uh, some uh, global symmetry of that Hamiltonian. So for example, if you have an XXZ chain with large anisotropy, uh, 
then you can get Ising order in the ground states and you get a, a pair of low-lying states with a gap that vanishes um, as you go to a large system. But that would be something which is excluded by our first condition. Uh, so that's one possibility. And the second possibility is that you have gapless excitations. So not just uh, a few low-lying states, but a whole branch of uh, gapless excitations. And one example there is uh, a Heisenberg chain, where we heard about spin-ons from uh, Anders. Um, but the third possibility, which is the one I'm leading up to, is that we have topological order and uh, so we have some uh, ground states which are uh, not distinguished by any kind of broken symmetry uh, but which are degenerate because there's a kind of uh, global order in the system. And uh, one of the ways in which uh, spin liquids are interesting is precisely because of this topological order, which is closely connected with the fractionalized excitations that we've seen um, classical analogs of. And uh, I want to head towards, in this lecture, some kind of picture for uh, what this means. Um, so are there any questions at, at this stage? OK, so um, I want to make a detour now into classical diamond models. But uh, before I go on that detour, I want to give a bit of a motivation. And the motivation really is the uh, resonating valence bond picture, the RVB picture. which, um, as we've heard, was suggested uh, in the 70s by Anderson when uh, he was first thinking about uh, spin liquids. So in uh, pictorial fashion, the idea is that we can think of the ground state as being a superposition of a whole set of states. And then these states we can represent pictorially by thinking of the lattice and saying in one of these basis states we have uh, some arrangement of singlets. So some particular arrangement like that and then this would be some different arrangement of singlets and so on. And then we'd have many more terms. Um, now it's quite difficult to make this absolutely concrete. And one of the difficulties was mentioned in Anders' lectures that uh, uh, different uh, states in this basis set are not orth orthogonal to each other. Um, but we're going to cut through those difficulties by uh, going directly to quantum diamond models. But before I can talk about quantum diamond models, I need to say some things about classical diamond models. And um, the uh, motivating idea that you might get from uh, this sort of picture of states is that uh, it's useful to think about states in terms of singlets. And if we restrict ourselves to nearest neighbor singlets, then uh, we can represent them uh, as dimers, that's to say uh, objects which sit on the lattice and cover a bond and the two sites uh, at either end. And um, if we restrict ourselves to uh, arrangements where every spin in the system forms part of a singlet, then it's natural to think about classical dimer coverings where every site in the lattice is uh, 
touch by exactly one dimer. So, talking about classical dimer models means talking about configurations. Um, so, first of all, a dimer is an object that covers covers a bond and the sites at either end and uh, a complete dimer covering means that we um, have one dimer on each bond and no sorry not one dimer on each bond uh, one dimer touching each site So if we take a piece out of a square lattice, then we might have a dimer on these two bonds and a dimer on this bond, and then this bond touched by a dimer and this bond touched by a dimer. So you have a rather simple problem in classical statistical physics um, if you think about averages over all arrangements of dimers that satisfy this basic rule. So it's a simple problem uh, in the sense that uh, every state that's allowed, every state that satisfies the rules has the same statistical weight, if you like, has the same energy. Um, now, eventually, we're going to want to put some quantum mechanics on top of this problem, uh, but it's useful before we do that to uh, think about uh, the long wavelength description of these configurations in the same spirit as uh, the way we thought about long wavelength descriptions of ground states on the, uh, in, in the triangular lattice Ising antiferromagnet or ground states in the spin ice problem. Um, are there any questions about the definition of diamond models? Um, so people thought about diamond problems um, before they thought about the quantum aspects, and they can come up in various situations. So one motivation is in uh, surface physics and if you have some crystalline surface which can absorb molecules if the molecules are, uh, are um, diatomic molecules then you may be able to represent them with dimers and so uh, absorb you know coverings of the absorbed molecules you could describe with a dimer model uh, there's also a very direct correspondence which I'll mention if I have time uh, with the uh, triangular lattice sizing antiferromagnet, there's a, there's a duality relation which I can explain. Sorry, they can have a... So in that way, these are different from actually the valence bonds that we are showing in the RBB picture, right? Because those are, I mean, some long range kind of actually uh, balance bonds is possible, but those will not be dimers, is that? Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm restricting myself to nearest neighbors here. Okay. 
Okay, so the next point is that we can make a mapping to fluxes which which is the analog of the mapping of spin ice ground states to the uh, emergent flux field that I talked about this morning. Um, and this story works in 2D and in 3D, um, but it only works if the lattice that we start from is bipartite. So a square lattice, for example, is bipartite, and um, the restriction is exactly the same as the restriction that I mentioned this morning uh, on the, uh, in the case of spin ice, uh, which was the, the lattice that the tetrahedra sit on, which, as I mentioned, is a diamond lattice. That needs to be uh, bipartite. And uh, the thing that we get from having a bipartite lattice is that we can give an orientation to the bonds uh, say uh, from the sites on sublattice A to the sites on sublattice B. So we can introduce a unit vector on a given bond, which is in the direction of the bond from uh, the first sublattice to the second. And then we can define a flux which is associated with a uh, dimer configuration, uh, which will be a flux of a field living in the same number of spatial dimensions as the lattice. Uh, so uh, 2D um, or 3D accordingly. And uh, this flux, it's um, in the direction of the bond and it's of strength uh, either minus one on the coordination number of the lattice or one minus one on the coordination number according to whether there's a dimer on the bond or no dimer. So in terms of pictures, if I say that this site is on the A sub lattice and so my bonds are directed from the A sublattice to the B sublattice, um, then the flux, well, where this dimer is present, uh, on this square lattice, I have a coordination number of four, so this uh, one over Z is a quarter, so I either have a flux of plus three quarters on an occupied bond or minus one quarter on an empty bond. So these pink arrows show the uh, orientation convention for the bonds, but now in blue I can draw three quarters for the flux on this occupied bond going away from this site and uh, one quarter in the opposite direction on the empty sites. So what you see is that uh, we've constructed by this uh, rule a divergence-free field that lives on the bonds. Um, and so it's exactly the same as uh, the uh, field, the emergent field that we had in the case of spin ice and it's related to the height field that uh, we had in two dimensions. So um, this is zero divergence in the allowed configurations. 
Now, um, these diamond models typically have uh, macroscopically many configurations, and you can get from one to another by finding some closed loop on the lattice, which uh, goes across bonds that are alternately occupied by a dimer and then empty, and then occupied uh, and then empty, and so on. And uh, once you've found a loop like that, you can shuffle the dimers one step around the loop and get another configuration. So that operation of moving dimers around the loop is essentially reversing the sign of the flux that goes around the loop. And uh, so uh, configurations which have a lot of short loops of that kind will be configurations with a lot of entropy. Uh, but then in turn, uh, they'll have small values of uh, the coarse-grained flux. Uh, and so um, if we try and write down uh, a long wavelength uh, description for the probability distribution of this flux, we arrive at precisely the same theories that I was talking about for uh, spin eyes and uh, in two dimensions for the uh, triangular lattice uh, Ising model. Um, yes, yes, and if we if we um, have gaps in the diamond covering, then we have things corresponding to excitations, as, as I'll explain in a moment. Um, uh, I could, yeah. Uh, OK, there's, there's a correspondence with the uh, triangular lattice sizing model, which I guess I'll mention briefly. So triangular lattice sizing antiferromagnet dimer correspondence um, if we think, first of all, about a section of the triangular lattice, then, um, as we discussed, in a uh, ground state of the Ising model, um, there should be two spins parallel and one in the opposite direction on every triangle, and that means that uh, one of the three bonds on every triangle is um, frustrated. Um, and we can get a correspondence to uh, a dimer problem from that, and the way to get it is to introduce a dual lattice, uh, which has sites in the middles of these triangles, and bonds like that. So you see, I hope, that the dual lattice is a honeycomb lattice. And um, then to get a dimer configuration from uh, a ground state of the triangular lattice Ising model, we uh, identify in each triangle the uh, bond which is frustrated and um, in the corresponding dimer model we put a, a dimer there. So if these two spins are up then uh, this bond is frustrated and we put a dimer, model, dimer there and if we're in a ground state then these two bonds, these other two uh, bonds on the triangular lattice must be unfrustrated and so we have no dimers on these two bonds and so we satisfy the rule that there's exactly one dimer touching this site and so if we uh, go through the lattice like that we have a correspondence between uh, ground states of the Ising model and dimer coverings on this uh, dual lattice, this honeycomb lattice uh, and so you see that uh, the height model representation 
that we had for the triangular lattice uh, Ising model will carry over to the uh, Daimler model. Um, okay, so a couple of other things to say about Daimler models. Um, One is uh, what happens if you introduce what you can call monomers. And this gives us, again, a classical picture of fractionalization. So if we have some covering of the lattice with um, dimers, we can ask what happens if we break one of the dimers up into two pieces um, and instead put two monomers there, which if you think back to the uh, valence bond picture as a motivation, is sort of the thing that you would do if you excited one of these singlets to make a, a triplet. Um, and then the point is that you can move one of these monomers around, leaving the other one where it was. So, for example, in this picture, I could uh, flip this dimer down and put a dimer on this bond, and then I'd move the monomer up to that site. And then you can imagine I could keep repeating moves like that and hop the one monomer uh, far away from the other. Um, and uh, in the classical language, the question would be whether there's any entropic force which uh, confines the two monomers. And in the case of spin ice, as I explained to you uh, this morning, uh, there is an entropic force, but it follows the three-dimensional Coulomb law and uh, it only costs a finite amount of entropy to separate a, a pair of monopoles to infinite separation. Uh, so we have some examples where uh, these monomer excitations are unconfined and uh, we'll be interested in uh, similar questions in the quantum setting. I mean, on the other hand, if you had uh, dimer arrangements which were ordered in some way, then it's likely that as you tried to separate one monomer from the other, you'd leave some kind of uh, trail which you could identify in the background. And uh, usually a trail like that will cost an energy which is proportional to its length, and that would lead to uh, dimer, uh, sorry, it would lead to monomer confinement. So uh, you can have in general here, uh, deconfinement which may be possible if the dimer background is liquid and so for that reason we're interested in situations uh, such as the um, triangular lattice uh, Ising model and the uh, spin ice model where at least at the classical level uh, we have uh, a disordered background of, of, uh, of spins or of dimers. Um, okay, so there's one more point which I want to make about classical dimer models, uh, which is uh, to pick up on this idea of an emergent flux. And um, to talk about uh, also the difference between bipartite and non-bipartite lattices. So first of all, with bipartite lattices, uh, we can discuss uh, 
a separation of the sets of ground states into flux sectors. So take the square lattice problem again and uh, think of some configuration of dimers and um, ask about the net flux flowing across some line in the lattice. So let me take a line across the lattice like that and um, ask about the total flux across this line, um, say from A to B. And in particular, we can be interested in how that changes if we make some rearrangement of the dimers in the way that I was describing. In other words, we find one of these loops consisting of alternately occupied and empty bonds and we shuffle the dimers around that loop so that um, I go from this configuration to one in which that bond is occupied and that bond is occupied and the ones that were occupied originally become empty. So according to uh, the uh, overall idea that um, the uh, flux is divergence zero. Um, if we make some rearrangement of the flux around some closed loop which cuts this line twice, then uh, there should be no change in the flux. So uh, the total flux is unchanged by local dimer rearrangements. And that means that if you have a system on a torus, you can uh, characterize the uh, states uh, by identifying uh, different sectors. Uh, and in each sector, you have a certain value of the flux winding uh, in each direction around the torus. Um, so uh, these flux sectors are um, specified and if you have some uh, rules that get you between uh, different dimer configurations, if those rules are local, then uh, they can't take you between uh, different flux sectors. Um, and because these fluxes can take a whole range of values on a bipartite lattice, uh, we can think of them in, in the limit as being uh, effectively uh, continuous valued uh, at least flux densities and um, so this kind of theory gets known as uh, a U1 theory uh, because it's like electromagnetism where you can have uh, continuously varying fluxes. So, Okay, so there's one remaining point which I want to make, 
in connection with classical Daimler models, which is uh, what happens if we go away from these bipartite lattices and think about uh, a lattice which uh, doesn't have that st structure. Well, the first point to make is that there's absolutely no obstacle to defining a Daimler model. And um, if I take a piece of a triangular lattice, say, then I can find a Daimler covering of it. Um, for example, put a Daimler there and one there and one there and one associated with this site there, say, and I can continue. Um, just respecting the rule that each site has uh, one dimer touching it. Um, so the dimer models exist and there are many diamond coverings I can still find uh, loops on the lattice which are made up alternately of occupied and empty bonds such as uh, a loop around here and I can shuffle the dimers around the loop and get to another configuration and so I have uh, macroscopic degeneracy. Um, but I can no longer think about these uh, dimer models on non-bipartite lattices in terms of an emergent flux field uh, because I don't have any way of giving an orientation convention to the bonds uh, or at least not one that will lead to uh, conserved fluxes. So I've got uh, uh, no emergent um, conserved flux But it turns out that there is a flux which is conserved modulo 2. Um, so we can ask again what happens to the number of dimers crossing some bond from A to B when we make a dimer rearrangement. Um, so we can consider two types of uh, dimer rearrangement um, according to the length of the loop uh, between the two places where it cuts this line. So if I have uh, an even number of steps between the first time I intersect the line and the second time, then when I shuffle the dimers around, I'll uh, go from being occupied to empty on this bond, but on the second bond where I cross the line, I'll go from being empty to occupied. And so uh, in that example, I have no change in the uh, number of dimers crossing the line. Or otherwise, um, I could think of a second example where I have uh, an odd number of steps uh, along the loop before I cross the bond a second time. And if I shuffle the dimers around, then this bond will go from being occupied to empty, and likewise this bond will go from being occupied to empty. So the uh, number of dimers across 
uh, that line uh, changes in even steps. So uh, it's conserved mod 2. And we do still have an idea of flux sectors, uh, but they're simply defined uh, by whether the number of dimers crossing a line around the torus is even or odd. Okay, and these differences between uh, bipartite and non-bipartite uh, models for classical dimers will carry over in important ways when we start talking about uh, quantum dimer models. Um, and the next thing that I want to go on to is uh, to describe uh, quantum dimer models. So are there any questions um, about the things which I've said so far? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, right, so an example would be a square lattice uh, and we consider the uh, dimer model on a torus and um, so if we start with a particular dimer configuration then uh, we can um, calculate for that dimer configuration the flux which is winding around the torus in each of the two cyclic directions. And then the statement is that if we make rearrangements of the dimers on short loops which don't go right around the torus, then those rearrangements will leave the flux uh, in each of the two winding directions unchanged. So uh, we have a very high degeneracy for the allowed dimer coverings, but we can split those uh, degenerate states up into different groups uh, and each group is characterized by the winding numbers uh, on the torus. Now uh, why you should call them U1, uh, well at that stage the winding numbers are uh, discrete but if you think about flux density and go to a continuum limit then uh, I mean, go to a, a large system size limit, then it's almost uh, continuous. Uh, any other? Yeah. Moves can be located around the local and hence they should not go around the top. Yes. That's yeah, the that's the only constriction. And, and if you do want to change flux sectors, then you have to consider loops that go around the torus. Um, Yes. Can I think of uh, the largest example, the largest case example where continuity in flux is going to be depressed by the flux of the Um No, not really, because uh, the, the kind of motivating idea behind them is um, the RVB picture. And the difficulty that stops you going directly from the RVP picture to these classical dimer models is that uh, different singlet configurations are not orthogonal basis states. So uh, one way of getting around that difficulty is to consider uh, SUN and go to large N. Um, but that's very different from going to the classical limit. And of course, if you go to the classical limit, you're defavoring singlets. <laughs>
Okay, so, so now we're at the stage of, um, on the one hand, having these classical Daimler models, which we've seen via this connection to a flux description, have uh, some of the same physics built into them as the classical frustrated magnets that we were thinking about. And um, from the Anderson RVB picture, we can also see a kind of connection to uh, a singlet description uh, of uh, possibly spin liquids. Uh, but at the same time, there's a kind of obstacle to making that connection directly uh, via this fact that um, different uh, singlet arrangements are not uh, orthogonal uh, basis states. So the idea with quantum Daimler models is to uh, legislate that uh, difficulty out of the way and just say we're going to consider a quantum model which takes these classical Daimler configurations that I've been talking about as the uh, basis states in Hilbert space. So we should write down a Hamiltonian that acts on those basis states and gives us matrix elements between them. Um, And what we want is a Hamiltonian that will produce quantum transitions between different arrangements of the dimers. So, for example, on one part of the lattice, I might have two dimers like that, and what I'd like to do is have a Hamiltonian that will give me transitions between other Daimler arrangements. And um, the suggestion from uh, Roxar and Kivelson is that the simplest kind of Hamiltonian that you could write down that does this kind of thing will have uh, two terms in it, um, which you can think of as a kinetic energy and a potential energy. Um, and the kinetic energy should hop you between different Daimler configurations, just like in a tight binding model. And we can write it schematically with some coefficient t for the kinetic energy by saying that it takes you between states like that. And then we want the Hermitian conjugate, which will be like that. And I'll talk about this a bit in a moment. Um, but then there's also a potential term, which is diagonal in this basis. And um, that's just uh, some other coefficient v times uh... okay so that's a very nice compact notation, but uh, it's important to appreciate what it, un what it means by uh, unpacking it a bit. So um, this is supposed to be a sum over plaquettes in the system. And um, when a particular term from the Hamiltonian acts on a uh, 
basis state, which is a particular one of these Daimler configurations, then taking the term from a given plaquette, uh, if the plaquette has uh, two dimers in that configuration, then, sorry, I look to have made a mistake, yep. Yeah, if the plaquette has two dimers in this configuration, then uh, it'll have unit overlap with this term, and in the state that you get from the action of this term, these two horizontal dimers will be replaced with two vertical dimers. On the other hand, when this term in the Hamiltonian acts on a state like that, they're orthogonal, and so you simply get zero. Uh, and then, again, if this term acts on that, you replace the state with the same thing and multiply by this coefficient b. So, uh, in other words, the action of this Hamiltonian would take you between uh, different states in the uh, Daimler basis, and uh, you'll have uh, these hopping coefficients to move around the Hilbert space. So, um, are there questions about what this model is? Y yes. Uh, so, yeah, so um, what you would ideally like to do is find uh, a Hamiltonian which firstly is as simple as possible but nevertheless gives you uh, uh, something that's ergodic within a flux sector. And uh, so if having a Hamiltonian with the, only the smallest loops in it uh, makes you ergodic within the flux sector, you're happy. And uh, if it doesn't, then you'd want to add some uh, larger loops to it. Yeah, that's the, the logic. OK. Um, so one thing that's uh, very convenient about these quantum Daimler models is that they can be studied using quantum Monte Carlo uh, without a, a sign problem. Uh, and I'll summarize some of what's been learned from quantum Monte Carlo simulations uh, in a little while. Um, but what's even nicer is that there's a special point in parameter space where we can uh, understand the uh, behavior of the ground state um, on the basis of things that we know about the classical model. So, as I've written it, the Hamiltonian has two parameters in it, T, the coefficient of the kinetic energy, and V, the coefficient of the potential energy. But, of course, um, what matters is uh, dimensionless parameters. So, uh, there's only one dimensionless parameter that controls the behavior of the model, which is the ratio of t over v. And uh, when that ratio is 1, then the behavior is very simple in a way that I will now explain. So at the roxar kivelson point, where t equals v, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian. Um, there's only one parameter, which is this t, and we've still got a sum over plaquettes. But we can combine the two terms and we have a difference between a vertical pair and a horizontal pair multiplied by the Hermitian conjugate. And 
you can check that if you expand this, then uh, you generate the uh, potential terms with a positive sign and the hopping terms with a negative sign. And so when V equals T, this is uh, a correct way to rewrite the Hamiltonian. But now you can see that because this is uh, a bra and a ket uh, together, it's a projection operator. Um, so the Hamiltonian is uh, sum of projection operators Uh, with uh, a positive coefficient so long as t is positive and I guess I'm taking these to be positive. So Hamiltonians that uh, sums of projection operators with positive coefficients uh, are pat particularly attractive things to think about theoretically um, because if you can find a wave function which is uh, orthogonal to all of these projection operators then um, it's a zero energy state and if the coefficients of the projection operators are all positive then uh, the ground state energy can't be uh, negative so the state that you find that survives this projection uh, is uh, a ground state. Um, and in fact it's easy to see what the ground state should be So, in general, the states in the Hilbert space that we're talking about of the Daimler model are superpositions of uh, Daimler configurations. With some expansion coefficient. So, what I mean is that we have some Daimler configuration a covering of the whole lattice uh, which is one of our basis states and in uh, a general state in the Hilbert space we superimpose lots of these with uh, in general uh, different coefficients and uh, what we want to do is find uh, a state which is orthogonal to this uh, projection operator on every plaquette and um, we can do that uh, by taking an equal amplitude superposition of all the states within a flux sector. Uh, so the ground state is um, one with ACs all equal within uh, a given flux sector. And the logic behind that is that a state which has a particular Daimler configuration in it will then carry exactly the same weight uh, as one which has the Daimler's horizontal. And so it's like a superposition of these two with a plus sign here, and therefore it's orthogonal to this projection operator. Um, and the nice thing about that is that once we're considering the quantum state, which is an equal amplitude superposition of all the classical states within uh, a given flux sector, then we can... Um, calculate a lot of properties uh, of this state just from what we know about uh, classical Daimler configurations because in particular uh, the expectation value of any operator that's diagonal in Daimler configurations 
can be got by uh, doing uh, by, by saying that the uh, quantum expectation value is the same as the uh, classical average over over the Daimler configurations. Um, So what that means is that um, if we ask, for instance, about correlations between the uh, dimers uh, in the ground state of the quantum dimer model at the RK point, uh, we can get those from the uh, study of, uh, of the classical problem. And as I explained, we know that we have liquid-like correlations in the classical problem. Uh, and so that already suggests that we've got some kind of liquid-like state for the uh, spin system. Um, the remaining questions are perhaps particularly to do with what happens when you go away from this uh, RK point. Uh, in other words, what's the whole phase diagram for these Daimler models uh, as a function of T over V? And um, that's something that we know uh, from doing uh, quantum Monte Carlo. And uh, it turns out to be something which uh, depends on the lattice. Uh, and uh, that's really the uh, final point that I, I want to make. So we can understand some things if we go to some extreme limits. So if we look, first of all, at what happens when V is bigger than T, well, the Hamiltonian is the one that we had at the roxar kivelson point plus V minus T times the diagonal terms. So if V is bigger than T, uh, this is positive. And if we want to find a ground state, we'll do well if we take uh, something which has none of these positive terms in it. And uh, so the ground state, in fact, is something which uh, just has a single dimer configuration in it. Uh, and that's uh, the dimer configuration known as the staggered state. So um, it's one where the Dimers are like that. Um, so this doesn't cost any of this potential energy because none of the plaquettes have pairs of parallel dimers. Uh, and uh, the terms in the roxar kivelson Hamiltonian uh, are also, also annihilate this state. So it's got zero energy. And because it's got zero energy, it must, have, it must be a ground state because uh, it's uh, an eigenstate of a Hamiltonian with only, only positive terms in it. Um, 
so for large, for v larger than t, we can identify the ground state. And uh, if we go in the opposite direction and um, take v to minus infinity, then um, we want to find states uh, as possible ground states that uh, maximize the number of parallel pairs. Um, and uh, so you can do that if you take some arrangement like that and like that. So um, both the states for v bigger than t and the state for v goes to minus infinity are states which break spatial symmetry uh, and which clearly are, are, are long range ordered. Um, so neither of them would correspond to uh, quantum spin liquids. And in particular, if we um, broke up a dimer into two monomers and tried to separate them, uh, then there'd be some linear trail of rearrangements of dimers, which suggests that we'd get uh, confinement of the, the excitations in both of these states. So the interesting thing is whether the liquid-like state that we uh, argued we should have at the roxar Gibson point is just a, a speciality of that point, or whether uh, it extends uh, over a finite interval in parameter space. And the answer turns out to depend on the kind of lattice that you're thinking about. And um, there are really three cases to discuss uh, according to whether we're talking about uh, bipartite uh, lattices or non-bipartite lattices and according to whether we're in uh, two dimensions or, or three dimensions. Uh, so in 2D, uh, we, could all, we could talk either about uh, a bipartite lattice such as the square lattice and the phase diagram as a function of V over T, uh, or the uh, triangular lattice, and again, as a function of V over T. And then we could go to 3D, and there would be differences. Uh, but the important thing is to think about the uh, bipartite case and for example, we could take the uh, diamond lattice. So in all these cases, we have uh, the RK point where we know that there's a liquid-like behavior. And um, to the right of the RK point, uh, I argued that we had uh, a staggered phase. So that's not a liquid phase. And in 2D, it turns out, well, all right, so for very negative values uh, of V, we have a columnar phase, which was the one I drew. And um, Close to the RK point in 2D, it turns out that you get another spatially ordered phase uh, known as a plaquette phase. Oh, really? Uh, and what replaces it? Columnar everywhere. Columnar everywhere. Okay. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, thanks. I, I didn't know that. Um, 
Okay, but the point that uh, is really important to emphasize is that on the square lattice, it turns out that the behavior at the RK point is uh, special, and it's actually a transition between uh, two uh, phases with different kinds of spatial symmetry breaking. Uh, whereas uh, on the triangular lattice, you get a whole window of uh, spin liquid phase, and it's only uh, further to the left that you get uh, spatially ordered phases. Uh, I don't know if it goes straight to a columna or, or whether there's something else intervening in between. Um, so uh, this liquid-like phase, uh, since it's on a non-bipartite lattice, is uh, characterized by these uh, Z2 uh, flux numbers. Uh, and um, and, and, and so we have a, an example of a, a two-dimensional spin liquid within this quantum Daimler model. Uh, which uh, has a, a Z2 uh, uh, gauge field uh, describing, uh, in fact, the topological order, and uh, which has fractionalized excitations, at least in the sense that if you break a dimer up into two monomers, they can uh, separate from each other because the uh, dimer background uh, is disordered. Um, and then on three-dimensional bipartite lattices, again, you can have uh, an RVB phase um, before uh, going over to uh, some uh, ordered phase uh, with uh, broken spatial symmetries. And uh, now, because we're on a bipartite lattice, the um, emergent gauge field that you use to describe this liquid phase is uh, precisely this uh, U1 phase, that, uh, U1 uh, gauge theory that we had at a classical level in uh, spin ice. Um, and um, the fact that you get this uh, different behavior uh, between um, bipartite and non-bipartite lattices in two dimensions uh, mirrors things that we know about um, lattice gauge theories uh, in the two cases. Um, because uh, if you um, go to the quantum model, then you expect uh, to have a, a kind of lattice gauge theory with uh, either U1 symmetry or Z2 symmetry. And uh, you, when you're asking whether you get a, a stable uh, liquid-like phase or not, uh, you're essentially asking whether you have uh, a deconfined phase uh, of the corresponding gauge theory. And so uh, we know that there are some general properties of gauge theories which uh, are that uh, Z2 gauge theories, Z2 gauge theories have both confined and deconfined phases in 2D and 3D, so that corresponds to this behavior in 2D, and if we go to 3D, then we also have uh, non-bipartite lattices where you'd expect to see uh, a liquid-like behavior. Uh, but for U1 theories, uh, we have uh, deconfined phases uh, in um, 3D, but not in 2D. So um, the behavior at the Roxar-Kivelson point on the uh, 
the square lattice is uh, a kind of special point between uh, two ordered phases rather than uh, a stable spin liquid phase. Um, okay, so those are the points that I wanted to make and I hope I've shown you that there's a path that goes from uh, some of the simple classical pictures that you can draw uh, for frustrated magnets, uh, at least in the direction of uh, these quantum systems uh, if you follow the route via uh, uh, quantum dimer models. So, thanks very much. Um, usually we assume that the spin base is orthogonal, right? And if you mm -hmm. assume that the quantum dimer base is orthogonal, it's, I mean, what kind of system would show that? Um, well, you can control the uh, orthogonality by going to uh, large n in SUN, I think. Um, but, I mean, I think it's better just to regard it as a way of cutting through the difficulties and uh, it, it, it gives you one approach to thinking about these problems. So it's, not, it's not that there's a controlled path from uh, the Heisenberg model to uh, quantum dimer models. It's just a, a different starting point. So the, the field that you defined was clearly, it was well defined for the U1 case, but for the non-bipartite lattices, it, it was not well defined. Right? It's not, so I mean, it, it's, uh, well, it's, it's defined modulo 2. I, I, I mean, it's an integer. It's just an integer which characterizes uh, the, uh, the different sectors. So as you were pointing out earlier, if you had to go back from a given field configuration to a spin configuration, or here to oh, a yeah, configuration. Oh yeah, yeah. Would that be difficult for? Uh, yeah, no. It's it's not a it's not a representation of the spin configuration. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what I, at least what I want to take from it is. Uh, Yeah, I, well, it, I, yeah, I want to take, it, take from it a way of classifying uh, winding number sectors. Or, yeah. Perhaps just one more quick clarification. So at the Roxar kivelson point, uh, it is liquid-like, the correlations are liquid-like, but the, uh, the, the monomers are not deconfined. Was that the statement? Or, or is it not? So you said it's not a stable spin liquid. Uh, yeah, no, the, at the Roxar Kifferson point, uh, monomers uh, are deconfined, um, but uh, it's not a stable phase. It's a uh, transition between uh, two different phases, with uh, uh, each one with, with a broken spatial symmetry. Uh, so the staggered state is in a different flux sector, I suppose. Yes. Uh, so the the Hamiltonian which you wrote doesn't have uh, terms which change the flux sector. So. Uh, right. So when you ask what the ground state is, part of the question could be which flux sector is the ground state in. Yeah. Uh, no, you're, you're saying as you increase V by T, you go to a staggered state. Uh, I don't see how that comes from the Hamiltonian. Um, so I think your question, uh, but, but correct me if you disagree, I think your question is essentially what happens, wh what's the ground state if we restrict ourselves to a different flux sector? 
um, to, to the zero flux center. Yes, yeah. okay. Um, well, you get, uh, I, I think you get good intuition to what the answer to that question should be by first of all recognizing that the uh, overall ground state is in this maximum flux sector and then um, if you restrict yourself to the uh, zero flux sector it's a bit like taking a ferromagnet but insisting on finding a, a low temperature state with zero net magnetization so in a ferromagnet if you uh, force uh, zero net magnetization then you force the system to have two domains uh, with opposite magnetizations that cancel so I think what would happen if you restrict yourself to the zero flux sector is that the uh, quantum ground state would be some kind of superposition of states but the states would all uh, have uh, macroscopic regions with uh, maximum flux in, in one region and uh, maximum flux in the opposite direction in, in the other region. Okay. Uh, one more question. So, in the spin liquid state, you have uh, algebraic correlations between uh, dimer size, of course. Uh, yes, that's right in the bipartite uh, case. And um, in the non bipartite case, although I didn't mention this, in point of fact, the uh, dimer correlations are typically exponentially decaying. Okay, so in the bipartite case, you can't have uh, monomer deconfinement. Is that right? Because if you have uh, algebraic correlations between dimers, then monomer correlations will also be algebraic. So. Um, well, you have some freedom um, as to how you extend the model to include monomers um, because uh, when I wrote down the Hamiltonian for the model obviously it only included uh, dynamics for the dimers. Uh, so the simplest way of adding monomers is just to leave them static so that the Hamiltonian doesn't rearrange the monomers. Uh, and um, without monomers the claim was that at the RK point, the uh, ground state is a zero energy state with uh, equal amplitude superposition of all the classical dimer configurations. And that statement then extends to configurations with a pair of monomers in. And you have uh, a zero energy ground state for each uh, possible configuration of the monomers. So in that, uh, in that formulation, there's no uh, confining potential at all uh, between the monomers. Uh, 